onto our program. I'm deeply honored to be welcoming tonight's speaker back to the forum. Uh, nearly a decade ago, Professor Reich came to the forum to discuss his book, Tales of a New America, in which he analyzed the challenges of a newly realigned global economy. Then professor at the Kennedy School of Government, he returns to us now as the Maurice B. Hexter Professor of Social and Economic Policy at the Heller Graduate School of Brandeis. You can imagine what that acronym is. And in the interim, of course, he's held a rather interesting position as well. As Secretary of Labor during President Clinton's first term, Professor Reich served as our nation's lead economic advisor, responsible for keeping watch over the internal workings of our nation's economy and creating policy with an eye toward an increasingly complex global economy. Under his leadership, the Labor Department took action on many significant fronts, raising the minimum wage, establishing a national system of skill standards, easing the transition from secondary education to the work front for the 75% of America's youth who are not graduated from college, and cracking down on unsafe work sites, such as sweatshops, both here and around the world. He comes to the forum this evening to offer us the long view of the changes we can expect to see as we move into a new century of economic opportunity and challenge. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to present to you Professor Robert Reich. Well, thank you very much, Bill, and thank all of you for braving the elements tonight, not only the elements with regard to uh, a huge amount of snow out there and no parking places as a result of the snow, but also bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. I've never, ever experienced Boston traffic worse than it was tonight. And there are probably hundreds of people on their way to the Forum right now, somewhere in greater Boston. Uh, but, uh, but thank you all and thank this forum for inviting me. Uh, I want to save enough time for questions and perhaps some answers, hopefully some answers to those questions, so I will make my remarks brief and to the point. And I will simply say this. The economy overall is doing wonderfully well, but there is a large problem it is a problem that has been festering and growing since the late 1970s. It is the problem of widening inequality. At every single point in the stepladder of our income in the United States, every step is now wider apart than it was 10 or 15 years ago. Earnings inequality is greater than it was even four years ago at the start of this expansion. We are seeing, and I am now referring to the latest data we have, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the census data and related data, we are seeing median wages and benefits. That is the person smack in the middle of the wage and benefit ladder going virtually nowhere. Uh, there's been a tremendous decline in health benefits, employer-provided health benefits, and also pension benefits. Now, it's true that average wages and benefits have gone up recently, but every time you hear somebody use the term average in describing this economy, watch your wallets. Shaquille O'Neal and I have an average height of six feet two. And for those of you who are listening to this broadcast, perhaps I should specify that I am far taller than Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, but the point I want to make is that averages don't tell us about the distribution. They don't tell us about the little guy. And there are many people in the American economy who are struggling very, very hard right now. And I'm not only talking about people who are on welfare or had been on welfare, who are in danger of losing it, or immigrants who are struggling legal immigrants in danger of losing food stamps and other aid, but the working poor, or the people just above them, the working class, or the lower middle class, or many, many middle class people are struggling very, very hard. As Secretary of Labor, 
I saw them across this country over the last four years. And even again, and I want to stress this, even in the recovery, we have this widening disparity and this very large percentage of Americans who are struggling. The paradox is that the social compact is coming apart precisely at the time when we have this wider and wider disparity. A disparity that in the first instance is related to globalization, technological change, all kinds of things that place a premium on education, on training, but the social compact that holds this society together, that stands for the proposition that everyone should have a chance to get ahead, that stands for the proposition that we are in the same boat together, that there is social insurance of various sorts, that stands for the simple proposition in the private sector that a company that makes more money and more profits ought to provide its workers with greater job security and a piece of the action in terms of higher wages and better benefits. All of those provisions of the explicit or implicit social compact we've developed over the last half century are splintering, are just coming apart. And why is it that that is happening now at a time when the country is splitting? Now at a time when we are evolving into the have mores and have lesses. If you ever needed a social compact to guarantee opportunity, to guarantee that there was a safety net for people, to guarantee that there was at least a possibility in the private sector that if your company was doing well, you could at least have your job. Why are we seeing all of these things coming apart? I think it has to do more with more, th with more than simply economics. I believe it has to do with some social assumptions, some political assumptions. And let me just give you three possible candidates for why we are seeing the gradual disintegration of this social compact. The first possibility is and I think there is something to all these, all three of these, we are no longer facing a common enemy in the society. There is no longer a cold war. There is no longer a sense, there's certainly no longer a hot war. There's not a depression. There is not uh, even international competition. We are now victorious. The Japanese are not challenging us any longer. In other words, all of the external threats or even internal threats in the form of a depression that remind people that we are all in the same boat are at this point in our history gone. And in some sense, that is a blessing. But in another sense, it, it serves to distance ourselves from the ties that bind us, from the commonality that we all share as members of the same society. A second possible reason for why the social compact is coming apart at the very time it's most needed. A second has to do with the fact that we are less dependent on one another economically than we have been in the past. I was reading recently, as I, as I often try to reread, the best commentator on American society, that's Alexis de Tocqueville, who in 1831 commented on the charitable impulses in America that were so distinct from European charitable impulses. In Europe, he said disdainfully, a lot of charity is based on noblesse oblige, on honor, on duty, on patriotism. Here in the United States, it's based on self-interest rightly understood, he said in 1831 language. And what he meant by self-interest rightly understood was enlightened self-interest. I am going to invest in you, in your education. I'm going to make sure that you are productive. The people around me, in my city, in my region, because the more productive you are, the more secure you are, the better off I am going to be because we are inextricably part of the same economy, the same local economy. But that is less the case today. The symbolic analysts, the people who are connected by fax and modem and all sorts of communication technologies to the great capitals of the world, they can, in to some sense, to some degree, isolate themselves from their communities or their regions. They can secede into gated communities, into, into office parks, into their own communication systems that, again, link them with the great communication centers of the rest of the world and the great symbolic analysts of the rest of the world, but 
distance themselves from their own regions, their own communities, the people around them. A third possible reason why the social compact is breaking down, I think, has to do with the sense that we know more than we have ever known before, each of us, where we are likely to end up. If we are very wealthy, we know that we are unlikely to need a safety net. Our children are unlikely to be poor. If we are very poor, we know that we are likely to need some sort of social compact and safety net. In other words, the, the sort of veil of ignorance, to use the felicitous phrase of the philosopher John Rawls, the veil of ignorance that we had used, that many Americans had used to project their, their understanding of fairness, to understand that, in a sense, anybody could need uh, welfare or food stamps. Anybody could need uh, the help of society. That sense of commonality in potential need is reduced because the widening inequality enables those of us who are well off to be fairly well certain that we are not going to be in need. There but for the grace of God go I know the better off now have a reasonable assurance that they will be fine. The consequences of this widening inequality that we are experiencing, the stagnation of median wages and benefits, and also the disintegration of the social safety net, the consequence, I believe, is very dire for our society. And I'm not talking only about the consequences for the moral authority of our nation, uh, but also the consequence with regard to domestic tranquility. Ultimately, there is no place to hide. One cannot secede from a society becoming ever more desperate. If there is a segment of our society that is becoming ever more desperate, and there is. And in addition, it is simply naive to assume that that portion of our society that is not getting anything out of economic growth, that is actually enduring most of the burden and most of the risk of economic growth, but none or virtually none of the benefits, it's naive to assume that they will simply passively continue to accept what they are, th their fates, what they are in effect failing to receive. Uh, right now, for example, in Washington, there is a very negative feeling in Congress toward free trade. Uh, Fast-track authority that the President would like to have to quickly uh, come, uh, get trade, trade treaties underway. That fast-track authority is not going to be given to the President anytime soon. Even Republicans are now, freshman Republicans, sophomore Republicans, are very negative about free trade. Where is this negativity coming from? It's coming from a lot of our population that feels that it is not gaining out of free trade. We see a similar negativity with regard to immigration. Uh, why is it that politicians are turning against immigrants? We see all kinds of you know, kind of anti-immigrant policies emanating up. Well. Again, to some extent, that is coming from a public, a portion of the public that feels very threatened by immigrants, by economic change, by internationalization of the economy. We see also the beginnings of reaction against technology in various ways, in various shapes. And again, this portion of our society that is not gaining ground is going to resist change unless they are benefiting from change. What worries me, perhaps most of all, is the silence. You hear a siren now. But I'm talking about the silence in Washington. There is no longer a discussion about inequality, about stagnant wages, about the bottom third or the bottom half, or what's happening to working poor or people at the very bottom. There's very little discussion. Now, a year ago, remember, there was a lot of discussion. You couldn't pick up a newspaper. You couldn't pick up a magazine without there being some discussion of the anxious middle class, the working class, what's happening to half the population. Why is there silence now? Have things got so much better? No, they are not better. In fact, the latest data we have show that the rate of layoffs 
is actually higher now than it was a year ago. More people are being laid off today than were being laid off a year ago. Median wages are not higher than they were a year ago. There is as much job insecurity. A recent survey by the University of Wisconsin asked people, do you think within the next year you are going to lose your job? And over the past three months, 17% said yes. Higher than a year ago. A year ago, only 14% said yes. So why the silence? Why the silence? At a time in our nation's history when we ought to be talking about this, we ought to be talking about ways to re-knit the social fabric, to overcome not only the widening inequality, but also the vanishing middle class. We depend on a widening middle class. We ought to be talking not only about education and job training, we ought to be facing up to the fact that states like this wonderful Commonwealth of Massachusetts are pulling money out of higher education. Over the last 16 years, here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, a 25% cut in real terms, in terms of state support for higher education. Why is that happening? We ought to be discussing these things. We ought to be talking about the importance of unions. And those who say that unions are not important, they ought to defend themselves. One of the reasons that we have this widening inequality is because of the decline in trade unions and blue-collar workers having less bargaining leverage than they had before. The minimum wage, yes, we got a little minimum wage hike, but that only brought us back up to where we were in the late 1980s. Minimum wage today is far lower than what it was in the 1970s or 1960s. There's been a steady decline in real terms in the value of the minimum wage. Here, too, we ought to be talking about all of this. Proposals that are now circulating in Washington to enable the wealthier and the healthier to opt out of Social Security and Medicare, medical savings accounts, privatization of Social Security, another step toward unraveling the social compact. Where is the discussion about this? Silence. You remember what Martin Luther King Jr. said about silence? We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Appalling silence. We need all of us not only to be talking about this, but to be engaged in developing a new progressivism in this country. A progressivism that unites the poor and the working class and the struggling middle class, not against the rich, this is not about our demonizing anyone, but creates the political possibility for everyone to be able to get ahead in this country once again, instead of us coming apart. A rising tide needs to be lifting all boats. John F. Kennedy talked about that in 1962, and then the rising tide did lift all boats, but the rising tide has been lifting only the yachts. The rowboats in the middle have been taking on water, and the little rafts and dinghies have been sinking for the past 15 years. I left Washington. I had a wonderful, wonderful time there. It was the best job I have ever had as Secretary of Labor. I feel like we did get something done, certainly attacking sweatshops and raising the minimum wage and reforming pension laws, and the President was absolutely behind all of this the moving and instigating party in a lot of this. I came back because I have a family here in Boston, and as much as I love my job, I love my family even more. And I have two young boys who are right now almost 13 and 16, and there won't be now any years left before they leave home. And the 16-year-old said to me on his 14th birthday, he said, Dad, only four years left at home, you better enjoy me while you have me. He is a wise ass, as they say. Uh, but I guarantee you, I guarantee you that I personally, and I know many of you, will continue to fight for these objectives. We'll continue to try to mobilize and energize people around this country around the objective of not just a new progressivism, but a vision that builds on the moral core of capitalism. And let me just end on this note, the moral core of American capitalism. What is that moral core? I found it, by the way, when 
we dealt with the minimum wage issue, when we dealt with sweatshops, when we dealt with child labor around the world, Americans were appalled. They supported in vast numbers, 80%, an increase in the minimum wage. They hated sweatshops. They were not buying goods made in sweatshops, child labor. People in this country, contrary to what some economists believe about, in, about everybody's self-interested behavior, people really do understand that there is an essential core of fairness to a society. And, it's, and it centers on work. And there are three, let me pause it with you, and I will make this my last comment. There are three ingredients to that moral core of capitalism. One ingredient is anyone who needs to work should be able to find a job. Anyone who needs to work should be able to find a job. The idea that we should have a natural rate of unemployment of 6%, 8 million people unemployed in order to avoid inflation, well then, that, that's simply uns that's, that's inappropriate. Then we ought to have public service jobs, or we ought to figure out other ways of employing people. That's number one. Number two, every job ought to pay a living wage. Not just a minimum wage, there ought to be a living wage. It ought to be possible for people, if they are working hard, to support their families, to have at least a Chevrolet, not a Cadillac, a Cadillac health insurance, but a Chevrolet, a little package of health insurance. Everyone. And number three, everyone who is willing to work hard ought to have a chance to get ahead through education and skills. These are not radical notions. These are at the heart of our, of our society. This is what made America strong. We believe in these notions, and we must act on these notions. We are not acting on these notions right now. There is a little parable of a frog in a pan of water. Do you know this parable? Anybody know that parable? Some of you don't. It describes what we are facing now. If you, and I must tell you, my two boys have never tried this following experiment. At least they tell me to tell you that, if I ever use this parable. If you throw a frog in a pan of boiling water, the frog immediately jumps out. Immediately. That primitive nervous system knows it has to leap. It must change course immediately. Get out of this boiling pan of water. But if you take that frog and put that frog into a pan of lukewarm water and gradually turn up the heat, slowly, gradually, click, click, That frog. I get a little emotional. It's his name was Clarence. No, he. They never did this. You know what I'm talking about. Do you understand the parable? You don't. Several of you are saying you don't have any idea what I'm talking about. What I mean simply is that the danger that we are facing with regard to a declining middle, widening inequality is a danger that is coming on us very, very slowly. And that makes it a greater danger than the kind of dangers we face that are obvious. This nation, when we face a depression or a war, or we face even a civil rights challenge, we roll up our sleeves, we get on with what has to be done. The most dangerous challenges to us are those that creep up on us so gradually that we don't know that we have to leap. We don't know that we have to change. And that's what worries me most of all. That's why the silence is so deathly dangerous. Again, thank you so much for coming out on this awful night. And I look forward to our conversation. Thank you. Now we have our question and answer period. There are microphones, I guess it's in the center of the microphone, so if you come up and uh, keep your questions to the point, and why don't you begin, sir? Since the 30s, we have been obsessed with controlling unemployment, as I understand it, uh, and as you have just advocated, uh, with the result that we have had about several hundred percent inflation since the 30s, uh, and we have created a lot of minimum wage jobs in order to keep unemployment down. During the same period, 
Germany has been obsessed with controlling inflation, and they have done that. Uh, with the result that in Germany, Big Macs are very expensive because people who work at McDonald's get paid $20 an hour. But on the other hand, there is much more equity in employment. They also have 12% unemployment, and they're willing to tolerate that because they don't want to create $5 an hour jobs, which they could do. Uh, I wonder uh, if you agree with most of this, if you, or any of it, if you think we should be less influenced by unemployment and Keynesianism, and whether you think Germany's problems are uh, social and economic problems are worse than ours. Well, well let me uh, answer, provide two related answers. Number one, there is no sign of inflation right now. In fact, the Purchasing Managers Index, which just came out a few days ago, this is the survey of people who in companies buy goods for the companies, showed that they were, they were facing lower prices in March than they were facing in February. And if you believe, as Alan Greenspan keeps telling us, that the consumer price index overstates inflation, there's even less worry about inflation. In fact, we may actually be deflating rather than inflating. Uh, my point simply is that we can afford lower interest rates, faster economic growth, much tighter labor markets, we can have much lower levels of unemployment, and not worry about inflation right now. There was a big debate in this country in the late 40s about full employment. At that, at that time, we faced about 3% unemployment. If it got 4%, people were scandalized by 4%. Now, we're talking about, can we really get below 6 and sustain it under 6%? Uh, well, I, I, again, I believe that we have got to acknowledge the economy is different from what it was even 10 years ago. There is no inflation now. There's much more competition, much more price competition. Finally, with regard to Europe, I don't believe that the trade-off is between a European version which accepts a great deal of structural unemployment for the sake of avoiding low-wage jobs and an American version that says, all right, we will have lower levels of unemployment than Europe, but we'll have a lot of low-wage jobs. I don't think that's the trade-off. It is possible to have the best of both worlds, which is, in the United States, take a flexible labor market, which is very good. Europe doesn't have a flexible labor I think it's very good to have a flexible labor market, but let's also simultaneously have the kind of apprenticeship systems, the education, the training possibilities that you have in Europe, particularly in Germany, the possibilities for people to get ahead, uh, the, the safety net in the form of particularly health insurance, child care, enabling people to go to work and be productive citizens. I remember so clearly the period after Clinton's election to his first term as the appointment announcements were being made, um, how thrilled I was about your appointment, um, Donna Shalala. When I heard Karen Nesbaum had been appointed, I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. Um, she was, she's great. She, yeah. was, she was assistant secretary uh, in charge of the Women's Bureau at the Department of Labor, which is the oldest part of the Department of Labor, yes. interestingly enough. Yes. Um, and I find myself very disappointed now. Um, in response to an earlier question, you talked as you talked directly after your appointment about the need for technical and vocational education. You're still selling the idea. How far do you think this administration has come with it? We've come some way, but not nearly far enough. Uh, there is now a school-to-work apprenticeship program. There are now 600, about 700,000 young people enrolled around the country. Uh, there are about, when I last looked, uh, about 500,000 employers involved. It's growing very fast, but it needs to grow much faster. Many young, more young people need to be involved. Uh, we have expanded the Pell Grant. We, I'm not, it's no longer we, the administration expanded the Pell Grants for disadvantaged young people to go on to higher education. Uh, there are proposals made by the administration to provide tax relief for working families for higher education. Uh, national standards for education, uh, K through 12 education. Uh, but we have such a long way to go, as I alluded to in my remarks. These are relatively small steps, and they are facing very powerful gale force winds moving in the opposite direction. Uh, Americans are segregating by income now more than ever before. The local tax base still provides most of the funding for local K through 12 education.
Well, if we are segregating by income and the local tax base is the major uh, funder for K-12 through education, you can understand why there are such disparities around this country in terms of the, uh, the resources available through to young people, uh, K-12. through uh, higher education is becoming more and more expensive as states withdraw from the kind of support they provided in the first 20, 30 years after the Second World War. Uh, we are busy at a national level balancing the budget, balancing the budget, and that takes precedence over many of the investments that we had intended originally to undertake. That, it seems to me, is unwise to the extent that investments in education, in training, in infrastructure, in the capacity of people to be more productive in the future. Those are investments that are appropriate for any society to make, even if you have to borrow money to make them. I mean, no family would fail to try to borrow money for education if they could borrow money, uh, and, uh, and therefore not balance their, 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 overall, their overall account, their overall living expenses. Um, no business would fail to make an investment in machinery, even if it meant going into debt, if that machinery were necessary for that business to grow. Same thing with education, same thing with infrastructure. Next question. Yes, I'd like to echo what the pre previous questioner said. I was also very pleased to hear when you were um, appointed to the cabinet, and at the time I knew nothing of your being a professor or scholarly publications. I just knew you was the guy from Marketplace. Um, Anyway, my question. Guy from Marketplace. <laughs> um, I'll have to think about that. <laughs> my question is: I wonder what your thoughts regarding um, the Helms-Burton Act and the continued embargo on Cuba are. Well, uh, I'm I'm happy to pontificate about almost any subject under the sun, uh, but that is a little bit beyond my expertise. Uh, I do think, over the long term, it is important to try to bring all of these countries, Cuba included into uh, the system of, of, of trade and commerce and, and investment. Uh, I don't think it's possible to isolate countries. I don't think it works. But on the other hand, uh, people tell me that there is some positive effect from that. Uh, I think it's unwise to use our laws in an extraterritorial way, that is, to impose our laws on third-party nations and expect 30 party nations to uh, somehow simply uh, simply follow us. Uh, it creates all kinds of international tensions. But, uh, but again, let me, uh, let me beg off of a full and complete answer to that question, because I just don't feel competent to answer it. Thank you. I wanted to uh, reflect on your earlier comments about the dangerous silence and how it's slowly creeping up on us. Those comments were made on a, a foundation of indicating that in periods of strife or difficulty in this country's history, we've managed to band together. And yet when not facing great adversity, there seems, tends to be a, less of that occurring. So my question is, does that insinuate a lesser sense of patriotism? And the second part of the question is, are you saying that we need great strife? Or in the words of Viktor Frankl, do we need struggle to give our lives meaning for us to come together? I certainly hope not. Uh, I, I don't recommend that we have another Cold War or a hot war or depression or any other uh, common adversary uh, to bring us together. I think that's a, that, would, that would be a, a, a terrible thing for this country. Uh, but I think it is the case, sociologically, that without some sense of common experience, uh, we, are, we are accepting the drift part. Uh, we, uh, there are not enough people saying, wait, hold it, do we really, really want to live in a society of have mores and have lesses? What can we do to revive and expand the middle class? What must we do? Uh, there's not the sense of urgency that one would expect. Now, remember, and let me underscore this. Uh, these trends are occurring even in an economic expansion. What happens when the economy, as all economies inevitably do, goes into recession? You know, recessions bring out, uh, it's almost as if the tide goes out and you see the foundation. Uh, you see the, the disrepair, uh, the cracks, 
all of the problems. It becomes even more difficult to repair because people then in a recession don't have the resources. The country doesn't have the resources. It has more of the resources now. And that's why we must take steps to repair that foundation. So what you suggest would be the driving force for that uh, on a national level? Well, as, as, I, as I tried to suggest, I think that if we stressed the moral core of our ec economic system, work, uh, even if we do not like the fact that there are handouts to people, if we don't, if we've turned our, our backs on, on welfare, let us take the logical next step and say, well, if we're not going to have a welfare system, let's have a work system. Let's make sure that everybody who needs a job gets a job, and let's also make sure that every job pays a living wage. And let's make sure that there really are opportunities to get ahead. Let's talk about corporate responsibility, corporate welfare. Let's use all of those resources that are in the federal budget right now, the subsidies, the tax subsidies, the direct subsidies to industries and companies that are there. We know, you know, I know that are there because companies have made big campaign contributions to get them. Let's get them out of that budget. Let's use those resources to educate our people, to provide training, to provide enough of a safety net, children, to give children health care, for example. Uh, corporate responsibility is a real issue. Let's ask our companies in this country, maybe even require our companies or induce them through the tax code, uh, not to lay people off if they are making money, if they're profitable. Redeploy those people or retrain them for another job, maybe outside the company, but give them severance pay. Thank you. Next question. Evening, sir. Um, I'd like to ask you, do you think that the major problems that have happened over the last four years that you were talking about earlier with the um, median wage not having increased and maybe even slid back a little attributable to foreign trade policies such as NAFTA and GATT in any substantial manner at all? I don't believe in, in terms of NAFTA, now, the trade with Mexico is a very, very small, and Canada, Canada is, is very big, and, and trade with Mexico is relatively small, but uh, those are not, and the evidence does not suggest that they have had any appreciable impact upon the kind of phenomena we're seeing. International trade in general is part of the phenomena, certainly. Uh, technological change, I think, is more important than international trade. Even if we put a wall around America and refuse to trade with people, we would still have fewer telephone operators. They'd be replaced by automatic switching equipment. We'd have uh, fewer bank tellers. They would be replaced by automatic teller machines. All of these people would, uh, would have to get other jobs. Uh, many of our people in mass production industries are being displaced by technology. It's the interaction between globalization and technology. Uh, that's the driving force. And it's not just trade, it's also global investment patterns. Um, so by perhaps advocating the drive retraining things that you were also talking about, that might, do you think that that might in long or short term uh, alleviate some of these problems? Well, education and training are 50% of the solution, but no more than 50% of the solution. We obviously have got to give people better schooling, better resources with regard to get higher education if they need it, or at least some additional training beyond high school. But we also have to have a living wage. We've got to make sure that the minimum wage is high enough. We've got to make sure that uh, there is adequate health care for our people and child care for our people. Uh, we've got to, I believe, have unions that are at least strong enough to uh, enable working people, blue-collar workers, to have some bargaining leverage. They have no bargaining leverage these days. Uh, what about uh, employee ownership or at least uh, stock options and, and uh, employee uh, sharing in profits or sharing in gains? Uh, there are some companies that are doing that, and the companies are very productive. This is not a zero-sum game in which shareholders lose to the extent that employees gain? No. Uh, employees treated well, treated as assets to be developed rather than as costs to be cut, are more productive. Next question. Thank you very much for your remarks. Um, I'm intrigued by um, your care and concern for the have-not 
And I'm intrigued by how casual you said, well, let's not demonize the rich. It seems as though the silence may continue if we don't see that there really is an enemy, an internal enemy, which is corporate cruelty. And, it, and so it seems as though we're faced with either this apathy and silence or getting really mad and saying, you're wrong to use wealth, to have so much wealth and to use it with the power that it's being used today. Um, the problem with blame or demonizing or the politics of resentment is it doesn't get you all that far. Uh, it may serve as a source of galvanizing some po politics. Uh, Pat Buchanan used it fairly successfully in New Hampshire. I don't like what he did. Uh, I don't like the politics of resentment. Uh, but what about taking the same approach but in a more positive way? What about saying, look at, let's change the securities laws so that if you are really patient with your capital, you have more proxy voting rights, or you have face a lower capital gains rate the longer you hold your stock. So we reduce the incentive for speculation in the system. We reduce the pressure on chief executive officers to show quarterly results, and they can take the longer term view. If they take the longer term view, some of these problems are alleviated because they understand that in the long term, uh, if they invest in their employees, the employees are going to be more profitable, more loyal, uh, more, more productive, I mean. Uh, there are other things we can do as well. Uh, I believe that we need to talk about a progressive income tax again, uh, rather, a rather quaint thought uh, <laughs> these days. But, uh, but, but given the disparities in, in wealth, I don't think it's uh, totally unwise to talk about a progressive income tax. Uh, corporate taxes have declined dramatically uh, over the last 15 years as a percentage of, of total government revenues. Uh, and given that only well, the top 10% of income earners in this country uh, own about 70% of the total wealth uh, represented by shares of stock, uh, raising the corporate income tax and using that tax uh, earmarking that tax, for example, for education or for child care or for uh, perhaps uh, health care for, uh, for children, I think that's an appropriate thing to consider. Do you think we do it unless people get mad? Well, therein lies, I think, one of the most interesting questions. As I said, uh, there, is a, there is a potential here, a potential view that we have to have an enemy in order to galvanize uh, our sense of common purpose. The downside of having an enemy, obviously, is that it deflects us from doing the commonsensical things we need to do. It, we, we just, as I said, we indulge in, in blame. Uh, you are asking, is it not necessary nonetheless in order to create a political movement to demonize something or somebody? And I hope the answer is no. Thank you. Next question. Uh, my, re my question is with regard to welfare reform. And my major concern is that as we have this shift in the trend to, uh, from uh, welfare to work, we're requiring all these welfare recipients and AFDC recipients to move into jobs. Um, my concern is about the displacement of low wage earners who are currently in jobs and where these jobs are going to come from. And I'm wondering if you believe, as uh, William Joyce Wilson does, that we're going to need some sort of massive jobs program to help. I mean, if we're going to require them to work, then there needs to be jobs for them. Yes, I, I believe we do have to have a jobs program. Uh, and it's going to cost money. And the question is, where do we get that money? Again, one place might be corporate welfare. Uh, let me also say, while you're on the issue of welfare, uh, the Massachusetts uh, legislature is right now considering uh, a provision, which I think is very important and very positive, which would enable someone to, sub to satisfy part of the work requirement by getting training, getting education. I think we all ought to support that. I think that's very important. That will enable people to get a better job. Okay. Thank you. Next question. I, uh, I'd like to ask you to, to elaborate a little bit uh, on your concept of a living wage. 
many ways kind of appealing, very appealing, uh, but uh, you've obviously given this a great deal of thought. What would a living wage look like? How do we get there? Um, and how does the economy uh, deal with such a thing? Well, right now we have two provisions of law which set effectively the minimum wage. One is the minimum wage itself, which will go next September up to $5.15 an hour. As I said, substantially below what it was in the late 1960s. Adjusted for inflation in the late 1960s, it was $6.50 an hour in today's dollars. Uh, the other provision we have is something called the Earned Income Tax Credit. Now, it's very important because this Earned Income Tax Credit is a refundable tax credit, meaning that if you're at the very bottom, you now get uh, something in the order of $3,000 or $3,500 back from the government. Uh, that helps you live. And you also get food stamps, or at least uh, hopefully qualify for food stamps. Those two together, minimum wage and the earned income tax credit, and also food stamps to the extent that they are available, provides the minimum right now for people who are working. That is not quite enough to bring a family of four out of poverty if you have one person who is at work. We need to make sure that one person at work is earning enough to bring a family of four out of poverty. And then I would say, let's, do, let's have a little bit of cushion on top of that. Let's make sure that that family of four is not only bring, brought out of poverty, but can get minimal health care. I'm talking about, again, I want to refer to, I, I refer to the kind of Chevrolet health care. I'm not, I'm not castigating or criticizing the Chevrolet company at all, uh, General Motors. I just mean that this is, this is, this is your, your minimum kind of cheap health care, but, but everybody ought to have this. We ought to, as part of the earned income tax credit or minimum wage or some combination, make sure it's high enough to give people minimum health care, and I would throw in child care as well. It is very difficult for people to work who are working class, lower, middle class, working poor, they cannot get safe, affordable, and good child care these days. So is it your feeling that if we did have that minimum health care and the child care provisions provided for working families, we'd be there? That we would actually have a situation where families would be guaranteed a living wage? And, or are you yes. actually talking about raising wages as well? I'm just curious about... I would, let me just re let me repeat, because I, I, I may not have stated it clearly enough. We've got to ensure that a family of four with one wage earner right. is out of poverty. And secondly, provide enough cushion above that to provide a minimum health care package and a minimum child care package. That would bring the total up to substantially higher than is now available through the minimum wage and the earned income tax credit. That means raising the minimum wage somewhat and also having a more generous earned income tax credit. Do you have any notion of what that number would be? Uh, for a family of four, the number I would, I would say, and this is a very, very rough estimate, mm -hmm. it would probably be in the range of about seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars $18,000. Now that's not much. Mm -hmm. That's very minimum, but a family of four is not earning that yeah. today yeah. with a full-time wage earner at the minimum wage. Next question. Do we have a political party in Washington that will break the silence? Uh, I'm a Democrat, and uh, look back to Roosevelt, to Johnson, and even beyond a little bit. Uh, we had a political party in Washington that did speak these issues. But uh, there's the silence now. And uh, what has become of the Democratic Party? And is there any hope of the Democratic Party reemerging to its historic uh, position on the issues that you have brought up tonight? Uh, well, the Democratic Party has very little choice. Um, look at the voting patterns over the last few years. According to the census, 60% of Americans with family incomes over $50,000 voted in the 94 midterm election. Now, that marked a slight increase over the 1990 midterm. By contrast, just 27% of those with incomes under $15,000 turned out in 1994. Uh, and that's markedly lower than the 34% of those with incomes under $15,000 who turned out in, in 1990. If you look at the presidential election, you see even greater divergence. In 1996, a lower percentage of, voting, of the voting population turned out uh, 
uh, that at any time since 1924, seven million people fewer than in 1992. Preliminary evidence suggests that almost all of the new non-voters were from households earning less than $50,000 a year. Three quarters of them had ended their formal education with high school. What I'm saying to you is that the largest political party in America is not the Democratic Party, it is not the Republican Party, it is the party of non-voters. If Democrats want to survive in the future, they've got to start enlisting the party of non-voters. Next question. Sounds like Nixon's silent majority. I don't believe that this is Nixon's silent majority. No, they're silent and they're a majority. But, but they're not Nixon's silent majority. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, William Wilson's uh, book, uh, Where's the Work Gone, something like that. One statistic really smacked me right between the eyes in terms of Chicago's urban inner city ghettos. Only 18% of the families have access to automobiles. Where are they supposed to find work? Because there's no work in the inner city. Which reminded me of George Lodge, George Lodge's campaign against Teddy back in 62, where Teddy was handing out teas and whatnot. And George was campaigning on the basis of, you've got to do something with the inner cities. You either pay to have your companies, corporations, rebuild in the inner cities, or you pay the workers living in the inner cities transportation to get to where the new corporations are, 128s and beyond, because that's when 128 was going on. Most of our transportation systems, our commuting systems, are designed to get people from the suburbs into the city in the morning and out of the city at night and we need reverse commuting systems that make it well, easy for people in the central city to get out to the suburbs where the jobs are. Except that you can get from inner city Boston to 128, but you're right at 128. You can't get from where you dropped off at the T-stop or the train station because there are no buses going from there Right. To where the jobs are. Well, I, I, I'm agreeing with you entirely. That would be... But at the same time, we can build lots of highways, right? We can build lots of airports, and we can pour all kinds of federal money into supporting cars and airplanes and airports. But we can't do anything for the people who really need it. Yeah, are, are we disagreeing? No. No. <laughs> no. Well, that's what I thought. Is that the end yeah. of your agreement? But I don't hear anything about this. You know, by the, let, let's, let, I want to revisit this issue of silence, because I think that this is a very important uh, leitmotif uh, theme this evening. When the welfare bill was being considered in Washington, particularly the third time around, when the president ultimately signed it, I would have expected Washington to be filled with people who were opposing this, marching through the streets, clamoring, uh, worrying, uh, declaiming the bill, marching through Congress, the halls of Congress. Washington was silent. There was nobody there. And the same thing with regard to many other provisions that today a lot of working class people, a lot of poor people, a lot of working poor say, we should never have done that, or we should never have done this, or we should never have made a fetish out of, out of reducing the budget deficit and, and balancing the budget at the expense of working people. Where were they? Where are they? Well, I can tell you where one person was <coughs> when the, they decided to cut off aid for the legal immigrants. George Soros put up fifty million dollars to help now that wasn't silence but it was greeted with a deafening silence a blurb on mcneil lair no mention on network news at all and nothing nothing from the democrats in washington nobody responded nobody going back it hasn't to always been silent 
Thank you. No, it hasn't always been silent, I indeed. Uh, again, uh, what, what, what concerns me is that if you have so many of the people who are losers in our society, and I don't mean just the very poor, I mean uh, many of the working poor, the lower working, the, the working class, lower middle class, if they are opting out of the system, if they're no longer voting, if they are silent, if they're basically saying, if they're resigned, if they're cynical, they are easy picking for the next demagogue who comes along and who indulges in the politics of resentment and hate and prejudice. History is filled with examples. Uh, we've got time for three more questions here. Go ahead, sir. You, you mentioned briefly uh, the need or I thought, I thought I heard you say that you felt there was a need for greater unionization. Um, I'd love to know where your position is on whether the, the uh, NLRA, the Labor Relations Act from the 30s, um, ought to just be rewritten. Um, there are those who think that uh, that has really uh, outlived its usefulness. One of the things it did is it, it seems to outlaw uh, the idea of a labor party of unions actually becoming getting all together and being a being a political party. Uh, do you feel that there ought that that ought to be legal? Should it be rewritten? And, and any other thoughts you have about what, what new labor relations act? I know do? the act very well. What provision is it that outlaws political activity or the creation of a political party? Well. I'd love to hear you. Uh, what your views are? About I don't mean to put. to be done. If I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I, I, I did put you on the spot, didn't yeah, I? A little bit. Uh, I, I, the national. I'm, I'm, I'm an employment lawyer, not a labor lawyer, so I don't know. <laughs> the, it that well. the, the the National Labor Relations Act is certainly not a perfect document, uh, but uh, many of the provisions in it are extremely important. Section 8A2, which guarantees the right of collective bargaining, is very much at the heart of our national labor relations system. Uh, I do not believe that the Supreme Court was correct in 1938 when it said that it is perfectly permissible for employers to permanently hire replacement workers well, when workers go on strike. I think that vitiates the entire point of a strike. That, by the way, striker replacement was rarely used by employers until the 1980s, until, the, until Ronald Reagan replaced the striking PATCO workers, who incidentally did not have a right to go on strike under the federal employment laws. But nonetheless, when he did that, he almost, and perhaps beyond almost, he almost made respectable the permanent replacement of striking workers. And that's a piece of legislation we tried to get uh, enacted. And, and so, I mean, since that seems to become, that's become understood now that that's fine to, to do that, ought it not to be rewritten so that that's clear? And is there any other, I agree. any other things that ought to be done in that? No, I, I, I would, I would say we had a majority in the House and the Senate in favor of barring the permanent replacement of striking workers, but we could not get 60 votes in the Senate. We needed 60 to overcome a Republican filibuster, and we had two votes short of the 60 we needed, and therefore it is still permissible. Uh, but I want to leave you all tonight not with a sense of hopelessness, not with a sense of despair, not with a sense of doom and gloom, but with a sense of possibility. Uh, there is, uh, there are a lot of things that can be done. This is not something we need to be resigned to. Uh, we are the wealthiest nation in the world. We are doing better than we've ever done before as a nation. We have no opponents in the world. The Cold War is over. This is a time to take action, not a time to throw up our hands and say nothing can be done. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Reich. After uh, tonight's speech, we're going to rename this the Chevrolet Hall Forum, I think. Um, but I want to thank you very much for one of the most compelling dialogues and interchanges we've ever had here. Very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.